Okay, so lab test one review. We're going to just go through this um, review sheet together and we will be omitting exercise one. We did not do exercise one on the scientific method in lab. So we will be omitting exercise one. So I'm going to omit that. Okay, and then I have know the meanings of the prefixes in the metric system and understand the importance of their relationships. And so that's what we just did together up on the board. Are you okay with that? And then I just talked to you about this one. Are you still okay on that one? Just what we just put up on the board. Okay, great. Okay, now then we're going to do some conversions. Now I want everybody to look at number two on your sheet. Now I've done these conversions for us real fast. Everybody look at, uh, on your sheet, look at number two. And on your sheet on number two, we're going to convert 23 centimeters to millimeters. And you're going to be asked to do that on your um, lab test to do some simple conversions. So I'm going to talk about number one real fast. Number one's the easy one. We have to convert 23 centimeters to millimeters. And I have the answer is 230. How did we get that? I didn't hear you. Okay, Amelia said she multiplied it by 10. Everybody okay on doing that one? Yes. Okay, look at the second one. You have to convert 368 millimeters to micrometers. And again, you could look up on the board to see what the conversion factor is and how to do that. Three hundred and sixty-eight thousand. Grant, you want to tell us how you came up with that? Because I agree with you, Grant. Uh, I multiplied three hundred and sixty-eight times one thousand. Very good. Multiplied it by the conversion factor, which is one thousand. That's very good. Okay, look at that last one, please. Six micrometers converted to nanometers. Anybody? 6,000. How'd you do that? Who told me that? Dane? Multiplied by 1,000. So it's pretty easy because you just have to um, take your conversion factor and move the decimal in the correct direction. Now, class, it is very important that you know which direction to move it. Sometimes you move it to the left, sometimes you move it to the right. Or some of you were telling me, well, I'm just going to multiply by a number. And that's fine, it, as long as you know your conversion factors. Here's another thing that I need you to know regarding those ideas, is that you also have to, um, so you could fight, yeah. That's so fascinating. Um, so I was in Belize a few weeks ago. I went to nine different islands in the month of May. Okay, I was traveling. Now I've got to pay the credit card bills, but that's not the point. I was in Belize, and Belize had been um, the British Honduras. It was a British country, but then when they became their own country, since the whole rest of Central America, South America, North America, we drive on the right side of the road, they went ahead and switched back over because they were driving like British people and... There were only people on the continent doing that, so they went ahead and switched back over. So that was interesting. But it would be cool if we could all drive on the right side of the road. Okay, I've got some uh, things I want to tell you about that are on the test that are going to be uh, skills related, showing me that you can do these things. You have to do them. And they are going to be able, uh, you have to be able to measure the length of something properly in centimeters, like use the little white ruler that's on your tabletop to measure something. Guys, you're also going to have to weigh something using the triple beam balance. Just want to remind you on the triple beam balance, make sure that your, uh, your weights fall into the notches 
on the triple beam balance to get an accurate weight. So you will be required to weigh something tomorrow. And then you are going to be asked to do volume two different ways. We had volume by displacement for irregularly shaped objects like a seashell. And we had volume by length times width times height for a regularly shaped object like a cube. To do length times width times height, I will require you to do that in centimeters. Make sure you're measuring in centimeters when you do your length times width times height. And you may bring a calculator to do your length times width times height because you will not be able to use your cell phone. Remember, no cell phones can be on you during the test. So if you have an inexpensive calculator that you can throw into your backpack to bring for tomorrow, uh, that would be great. Just speaking of the calculator, during the semester we will also have to be uh, uh, using a square button and a square root button. So if you can find a calculator at your home that does you know, all the basic functions plus it does square and square root, that would be a good thing to put in your backpack to take you through the rest of the semester. So you may have a question about that. Okay, we talked about the meniscus the other day. Everybody told me they knew what I was talking about. I know this is an excellent drawing right here. What is this an excellent drawing of? It's a graduate cylinder. And if you'll notice, I just used pink here to color in this uh, liquid. You could pretend this was liquid in here. And if you'll notice, this liquid doesn't go straight across. It dips in the middle, and we call that dip the meniscus. How do you properly read a meniscus? You had to read the lowest point eye level, okay? And because you should be able to read a graduated cylinder, you have to hit it on the nail on reading them, okay? And I'm just making this up. If I have 46 milliliters of water in a graduated cylinder, I'm going to have 46 as a choice, but I'm also going to have 45.5, uh, 46.5. You've got to be able to read a graduated cylinder. Just make sure you get eye level and you count those lines and you read the bottom of the meniscus. Is everybody okay with that? Great. Okay, let me just glance back at exercise two microscopy. Was there anything there that we missed that you need me to tell, tell, talk about again? Sir? Say what? I'm sorry, metric measurement. Okay, good. All right, so on microscopy, have a general idea what kind of microscope would be appropriate for viewing various objects. Guys, page 14 is a good page to reference for that. I recall page 14. We spent a little bit of time on page 14. If you have your lab manual, page 14. Now, in our lab, everybody, we do have a compound light microscope that would have taken the picture letter A of blood. Just check out at the bottom right-hand corner of letter A. Does everybody see that four micrometers? That's just what kind of we were talking about a minute ago. As a matter of fact, all of these have micrometers over in the corner. But the other scope that we have in our lab is a stereoscope. And I want to remind you the stereoscope is on page 16. Now, we had those out last Monday on the perimeter of the room. And we had things on them like a white moth, a monarch butterfly. Uh, some of us got to look at a starfish. There were some plant materials like a flower was on there, Do you, a, a peacock feather. Do you guys remember that? So the stereoscope might be another option that I might ask you about on the test on what would you use to look at something. When would you use a stereoscope? Like when would that, would be, would that be useful? Like would you use a stereoscope to look at someone's blood? No. 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 Would you use a stereoscope to look at someone's hair? Yes. Yes. And so the idea is stereoscopes are like really great magnifying glasses. And they're really useful to use if you wouldn't be able to make a wet mount out of what you're trying to, to view. 
you wouldn't be able to get it thin enough and liquidy enough to make a wet mount. You know, to look at something under the compound light microscope, you have to make a wet mount out of it. If you couldn't make a wet mount out of it, you're not going to see it on a compound light microscope. Okay, I have number two. How are light microscopes and electron microscopes different? And I think it's kind of obvious. Light microscopes use light as a source of illumination, of energy. But electron microscopes use beams of electrons. Okay, so that's kind of obvious. And then which one gives you higher magnifications? Electrons. Definitely electron microscopes. I mean, we can, if, as far as I know, technology is still improving this number, but as far as I know, we can go up to a 250,000x with a transmission electron microscope. We can only go to 1500x with a light microscope. So there's a huge difference in magnification ability. Okay, I have number three, know how to use a dissecting, also known as a stereo microscope, and what can you view with it? Again, a stereo microscope is really great for viewing things that you can't make wet mounts out of, but that you want to see more magnification of. So again, a stereoscope would be like a really great magnifying glass. Really great. And again, a picture of a stereoscope is on page 16. Okay, question number four, you, I'll put some stars on this one because there will be several questions on question number four. We spent quite a bit of time going over the parts of a microscope and what the parts are used for. You've got a picture of one on page 19, but as I told you before, it's going to be your actual microscope, the one you actually use that will be on the test. And what I do is I just put stickers on the parts I want you to identify. So make sure you put a couple stars on that one. Okay, number five, know how to use the compound light microscope on low and high power. Well, first of all, um, you wouldn't actually start on low power. If you were using a compound light microscope, which objective would you click into position to start with? Scanning. Scanning. You'd start there because it gives you the biggest field of view. And then you go to low power, then you go to high power. Um, when you click in scanning to get started, what knob are you going to use to focus with? Nope. Focus. Look on page 19. Not the fine adjustment. The coarse. You start with the coarse adjustment, right? You'll use that one first and then fine-tune it with the fine adjustment. Now, should you adjust the light? Yes. yes. Should you always have as much light possible? No. no. Ian and Colton, no. You shouldn't always have as much light possible because too much light cuts down on the detail. It causes glare and it cuts down on the detail. You can't see as much detail with too much light. Okay, let's say that we went from scanning to low and then from low to high. What adjustments can you use on high power to focus? Fine. Only the fine. When you're on high power, all you can use is the fine. You cannot use the coarse on high power. You cannot use the coarse on high power. Multiple choice, okay. like, or true, false, like, um, I can use coarse and fine adjustment on scanning, and you'd pick true. Or high power has the largest field of view, you'd pick false. But we will still be using things like the measurements, like the measurement tools to find the answers. For mm -hmm. And everything's multiple choice. Okay. Okay, guys, we looked at the letter E. Put a little letter E up there. We looked at the letter E under the microscope. Let's say that you found the letter E and you uh, moved up to 10x. You went, you found it on 4x, right? You always start on 4x, and then you moved to 10x, and there it was. 
What should you do with that letter E before you go to 40X? Thank you, Blair. You need to center it. Center it. Why? Yeah, if you don't center the letter E and you go up to high power, is it going to be there? Probably not. Probably not. Matter of fact, I know it's not. That's way too high and way off to the right. It's not going to be there. Because if this is the field of view on 10x, this is the field of view on 40x. It's not going to be there. So Blair's right. Every time you go higher in magnification, you need to center whatever you're viewing before you go higher. But okay with that idea? Super. Okay, you have to be able to calculate total magnification. And everybody, we did that on page 21. Table 2.3. Now, there is a basic formula here. Everybody, study that table and see if you can figure out the basic formula for calculating total magnification. I'm ready. Tell me again. I didn't hear you. Okay, why do you multiply by 10? What has the magnification of 10? The ocular. And so, what are you multiplying by 10? Whatever the magnification of the objective is. Objective. Very good. So the basic calculation, no matter what microscope you're using, is objective times ocular. Correct? Objective times ocular. How do you find the magnifications on the microscope? They're on the side of the objective. They're on there, but how do you know which number? There's bunches of numbers there. The one that has an X by it. The number that has an X by it is the magnification for that piece of glass. So just use those numbers. Okay, on total magnification. Okay. Total magnification. I have which objective would give you the large field of view? Scanning. Scanning. Very good. Okay, this is question number six. What is inversion? What does that even mean, inversion? Mirrored. Mirrored. Okay, so, I don't know. If I look in the mirror, my left has become my right. The top and bottom. That's right. So, total inversion means top is bottom, left is right. An upside down mirror. It's an upside down mirror, okay. So, Left becomes right, top becomes bottom. What letter of the alphabet did we use to study inversion? E. The letter E. That's right. Okay, so top becomes bottom, left becomes right. I have how does inversion relate to microscope usage? Why do you care? Say, it inverts the image. Okay, and so I want to tell you that on those prepared slides, uh, technicians, when they make the prepared slides, they always put the, um, the specimen upside down. Like, for example, in Biology 2, you're going to study skin, and the technician, if they did their job correctly, They'll put the skin upside down on the slide so that when you look at skin, it will be right side up. Yeah. Okay, what about movement under the microscope? Left is right. Left is right. Right is left. Top is bottom. Bottom is top. Okay, good. So all movements opposite under the microscope. Movement is opposite under the microscope. It's hard to think about when you're using a microscope to move opposite. 
Okay, look at exercise number two, microscopy. Is there anything there that you'd like for me to go over again? Exercise two, microscopy. Yes, ma'am, that's correct. Amelia said, is this review sheet a reflection of what's going to be on the test tomorrow? And the answer is yes. Okay, exercise three, the chemical composition of cells. Before we get started on this, would you open your lab manual to page 40? Page 40. I know you know all of this, but in case you've forgotten since last week, page 40 will be a great place for you to look at. You may recall on page 40, you made a table. Page 40 is an important table. Okay, Abigail. You on page 40? Great. Abigail, what is the, t what chemical do we use to test for protein, Abigail? All right. Good. Okay, Amelia, what is a positive color for protein? Purple. That's good. Sergio, a negative color? Blue. Good. We have a question about number one, protein. Going back to, to Dane's table. Dane, what is uh, the chemical use test for starch? Megan, what's a positive color? That's good. Amanda, a negative color? We have a question about using starch. Okay, uh, Cheyenne, I think we're to you. Cheyenne, what chemical is used to test for sugar? Excellent. Desiree, I need positive colors. Good. It's good. Haley, any negative color? Okay, so I think we've figured out we have to know page 40 for the test. Okay, Nikki. How do you use brown paper to test for lipid? Nikki, if I see a translucent spot, is that positive for lipid? Yes. yes. Non-translucent? Negative. But he's still remembering this okay. It was just last week. Great. Okay. I have what are the building blocks of carbs? Well, page 28 is a great page for this. In our laboratory manual. Carbohydrates are sugars and molecules that are chains of sugars. So obviously sugars are the building blocks of carbohydrates. But I'm pretty sure sugar is not a choice on the test. It's too generic. Instead, I'm going to have this word. Monosaccharides, which means simple sugar, a single sugar. That's the biology word for simple sugars, monosaccharide monosaccharide. Okay, so a similar type of question, but this one's for lipids. And if you don't know the answer, what's this on our test today? What, what's a lipid, a fat made out of? Is that on our test today? Yeah. Fatty acids and... Glycerol, page 34. I thought it was on her test today. Okay, then. We'll see what happens. Page 34. 
there it is, glycerol, which is an alcohol, and then one, two, three fatty acids. That's everybody's favorite friend there, fat. Mm -hmm. They prefer mass challenge acids. Mm. Mm. Or something else. Hey, was this on our test today? How many, uh, went back to number two, how many um, calories per gram are in a carb? How many calories per gram are in a lipid? Isn't that one of our questions today? Yes. Yeah, it was. Which one has the highest energy value? Oh, yeah. And the answer was? Lipids. I cannot wait to grade these tests. How many, how many calories are in a protein per gram? Four. Good. All right. How about this question? What are the building blocks of proteins? Amino acids, and if you need a page number, that's page 33. Amino acids. As a matter of fact, I remember a drawing of an amino acid on your test. It's a little Look at these faces. You're making faces. Look at my face. <laughs> you should see yours. Okay, then. Okay. I have how are monomers combined to produce polymers. So let's just say that I want to take an amino acid and join it together with another amino acid to make something called a dipeptide. Whoops. So that would be an amino acid joined to an amino acid. That's a dipeptide. First of all, what else would I make besides a dipeptide? Water. Water. What kind of chemical reaction is this? Dehydration. Dehydration. Good job. That was on our test today, too. I saw it on there, too. Yeah. Existing just a little bit of overlap. Yes, and so in science, especially biology, I don't know about the other sciences, but we try to design our labs to complement the lecture portion of the test. I mean, of the course. But okay on that. Now, again, if you'd like a page number to see what that looks like, page 33 is, again, an excellent uh, page for reference in your laboratory manual where we have one amino acid combining with another amino acid doing dehydration, making the dipeptide plus water. There it is. Just want to point out a similar thing. Just real quickly, would you glance at page 28? Notice that that's similar, page 28. But instead of amino acids on page 28, what's combining on amino acids? Excuse me. What's combining on page 28? Monosaccharides. Instead of making a dipeptide, what do you make on page 28? A disaccharide. Did everybody see the similarity? Okay. So either looking at page 28 or page 33, either page will do. How are polymers broken down to produce monomers? Hydrolysis. And again, page 28 or page 33 are great references for that. Frankly, even page 34 is a good reference for that. Building of a fat and breaking down of a fat. That shows dehydration and hydrolysis also. I guess that was all number two. Okay, what's a monosaccharide? A simple sugar. Samantha, have I asked you a question today? Could you give me an example of a monosaccharide? And guys, if you need a page number, that's page 28. Samantha, what's an example of a monosaccharide? Excellent. 
some of you really like fructose. That's a good example. Like Haley was just, Haley, were you, oh, and let me see. Nikki, you're drinking a Sprite. Haley, you had a Coke. Grant's got a Sprite. That's all I'm seeing right now. Those things are loaded with fructose. And that's a good example of a monosaccharide. Okay, I'm heading over to... Mm, thinking, I'm thinking. Amadi. Yeah. Tell me your name again. Mm -hmm. A yachty. Got it. A yachty. A yachty. I need a disaccharide. Page 28 is a great reference. And then, uh, oh, you can give me both. I really like your, your um, enthusiasm for this question. What, what is it? Thank you so much. What is a disaccharide? I'm going to go more generic. I'm going to say two monosaccharides are joined. Uh, a, it's a yachty. A yachty said, for example, glucose joins with glucose and makes and Put glucose plus glucose together again on page 28. Ayati? Maltose. Good. Everybody, maltose is a great example of a disaccharide. Can anybody add another example of a disaccharide? Starts with an S. Thank you. That may be your own personal favorite. Sucrose. Cakes, cookies, frosting. Cookies with frosting. <laughs> they are good. Let's see. It's Janet. Need a polysaccharide. Go ahead and define it for me. What's poly mean? Many. What does saccharide mean? Sugars, good. So this basically is three or more. All right, Janet, page 29 is a good example. Or you could find a good example of a polysaccharide on page 29 if you can't think of one. I can't hear you, I'm sorry. It would be. Starch is a great one. Now, starch is made out of sugar, so that shouldn't be a major part of your diet. Just want to comment. The hamburger buns on hamburgers, that's made out of starch. Bread is made out of starch. Doesn't matter if it's made from corn, rice, wheat, rye, barley, it's made out of starch. Okay, pasta is made out of starch. But the one you should be eating a lot of that's a polysaccharide is called cellulose. That one's better for you. Because starch, you completely break down into sugar. Can you break down cellulose? Yeah. No. It's fiber. it's fiber. Eat more cellulose. Not to be like disgusting, but doesn't it make you go to the It surely does. And that's not disgusting at all. When you can't go to the bathroom, that's when it gets disgusting, yes. Okay, so Amelia's right that fiber, also known as cellulose, helps you in two ways. It keeps you um, going to the restroom, so it keeps the food moving through your food tube. Then that means you're not constipated, but more importantly, you're reducing your risk for colon cancer. And number two, it makes you feel full. So it's helping you with your weight control. As Americans have problems with weight control, 35% of our population is obese. I think it'll be what I want to help the apocalypse happen. 
No, poor plant. Okay. No, don't don't count on apocalypse. Um. Hey, and same thing on smoking. People who are smoking, they're going to do the same thing. They're going to spend all their time in the hospital later. We're going to have to pay more in our insurance premiums and more taxes because they're going to be in the hospital all the time. Let's get out there and get to the gym, people. Okay, we're going to a harder question. And I think we're over to Will. Good morning, Will. Question number four, what's a common energy storage form of glucose in plants? And Will, I'm going to give you a hint. It is a polysaccharide, and it is on page 29. Sorry. It is. This is how plants stored their extra energy that they made from photosynthesis. This is such an easy question, nobody gets it right. What plant structures store this substance? Starch grains. We saw starch grains under the microscope last Thursday. We made a thin wet mount of starch. How, excuse me, of potato. We made a thin wet mount of potato. What did we add to the potato so that we could see the starch? Iodine, excellent. Specifically. It's the only one that I know of. And you know what the grand thing about it is? It's the cheapest biological stain. Very inexpensive, too. Isn't that great? Yeah. Oh, dear. Let's go to Grant with this question. I have a structural polysaccharide that's made by plants. It's totally made out of glucose, but instead of being used for energy, it's used for structure. Cell wall? It makes the cell wall. Oh. This is the chemical that makes the cell wall. Cellulose? Mm. Or however you pronounce it. Mm -hmm. It's a cellulose. It's made of glucose also. But unlike starch, you cannot digest it. Because unlike starch, it's not designed to be broken down. It's designed to not be broken down. Okay, Grant already answered this question. What cell part is composed of this? So let me put plant. Jacob, I think we're to you. Good morning, Jacob. Number six, what term describes the bond between amino acids and a protein? And guys, while Jacob's getting me an answer, I want to give you a reference page for this one, page 33. Go ahead, Jacob, when you're ready. Top of page 33? It surely is. Excellent job. Peptide bond. Okay. There's a chemical that specifically recognizes peptide bonds. What is it? Pepsi. No. Starts with a B. Okay. It starts with a B. Tell me again. By your red. Isn't that what we use to test for protein? Because it specifically recognizes peptide bonds. Proteins have peptide bonds. Okay. I drew two test tubes up here. You don't have to um, visualize this if you don't want to, but Page 35 and page 36 is where I'm going with this one. So one day last week, I think it was um, 
Wednesday. We took two test tubes and we put um, oil in both of the test tubes. But in one test tube, we put water, and in one test tube, we put the emulsifier called bile. And we have, to, we have to be able to figure out which one has the emulsifier and which one doesn't. Now, on the test, the test tube won't say water and it won't say bile. It won't say anything. Okay, it'll just be two test tubes. And you have to figure out which one is water and oil, which one is bile and oil. Now, I do want to tell you that these test tubes have caps on them so that you can pick them up and shake them and then hold them to the light. Now, let's say you shake them. One of the test tubes is going to just separate back into two layers. Which one is that? Water. One of them is going to make little bubbles of oil. Which one is that? The bile. Bile is an emulsifier. We did this together, everybody, on page 36. Maybe you t wrote some notes about it. I don't know. We did test tubes 1 and 2, omit number 3. It's on page 36. Okay, and again, yes, you can pick up the test tubes and shake them, hold them up to the light, see what you can see tomorrow on the test. Okay, adipose is tissue in your body. It looks like page 37. What does that look like to you at the top of page 37? Everybody look with me. What's that look like to you? It's like bubbles to me. How about you? Like bubbles? Potatoes. Yeah. It does look like potato cells, yeah. And like potato cells, adipose cells are storage cells. Those cells we looked at under the microscope from potatoes, those were storage cells too. Those cells are storing starch. In your body, these cells are not storing starch. What are they storing? Fat. Fat. Yeah. Fat. We call that adipose. Adipose. So be able to recognize adipose. It looks like bubbles. Okay, I need three functions of adipose. And let me see. Myra, I don't think we've spoken with you today. Can you give me a function of adipose? Um, it stores fat. It sure does. And don't forget, fat is energy. Because fat has nine calories per gram. <laughs> Okay, Alma, can you give me um, a second function of adipose? Excellent insulation. Hey, Ray, can you give me another function? I need three of them of adipose. Function. Say it again. Cushioning. Because it's all squishy. Ian, where can you find adipose in anybody's body? Any human body, where would it be at? How about in your body, Ian? Where is adipose at in your body? Everywhere. It's under something. It is. Bunches of it under your skin. It, that's where it's at. Okay, here I go off of my obesity thing again. So, if you are obese... It's not just under your skin. It starts accumulating in and around all your organs and um, inside some of your organs. I want to tell you this real fast. 